so things haven't turned out as you hoped. Life took a turn. A bump. A darkened sky. And at times, it may have seemed there was no hope. But here's the good news. Our God is the God of fresh starts. Our God is the God of new beginnings. Our God brings new mercies, new compassions, not just once a year, not just when things are bad, but every single morning. This season has been tough. And for many of us, things will never be the same. But we are here, breathing, maybe smiling, or crying, or shouting, or laughing. But we are here, feeling, maybe fighting, or cheering, or seeking, or grieving, but we are here living and we are not alone our God is here our God is with us and our God is the God of new creations So church family, would you pray with me? Let's ask God to bless the preaching of the word. Heavenly Father, let us see these moments in the right way. That there is truly nothing better than meeting with you and hearing your voice. When you were transfigured, the disciples said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And let us have that sense as we hear your voice. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, it was a couple years ago that our youth group went to a youth rally in Fort Collins, Colorado. And while we were there, we had the opportunity to go to Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, which is in Estes Park. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Rocky Mountain National Park. I remember going there with this crew and uh, being like, man, uh, everyone needs to know that this place exists. When, when you saw the mountains, when you saw the lookout lakes, when we were hiking the trails, I'm like, man, this is incomplete because I got to show Kat. I got to show the girls. I got to show my mom that such a place really exists. Mountains and their grandeur have a way of taking our breath away. They have a way of saying, you're small, this is big, all in an echo of the greatness of God. And while we were there, I'm glad that this event didn't occur. While we were there, I'm glad that there wasn't an earthquake. Because I would be terrified if I was climbing up, looking out, and then the ground beneath me started to shake as I was on top of the mountain. That would not be a good feeling, friends. I was glad that when we got to Lookout Lake, that the mountain behind us didn't start shaking and crash into the sea. Because if it had, I'd have been freaked out. And I bring that up because as you go to Rocky Mountain National Park, that's probably not going to happen to you, don't worry. It's not known for earthquakes, tectonic plates. We have yet to see a mountain fall into a sea. We've seen volcanoes. But I bring this up because what we do have in all of our lives are mountain-shaking moments. We do have doctor visits and a diagnosis that makes us feel like the world is collapsing. We do have transitions to new schools, to new jobs, to new locations that make us wonder, am I going to fit in? 
My whole world is gone. This is a new world. Is it going to work out? We all have mountain-shaking moments. And that's why I love this moment. Because we have a God who's over the mountains. And we have a God who speaks peace to our hearts. A God who assures us that when we're not enough, he always is. And so we're going to refer to the word of God. I want to set up the context for the word. In the word of God, God's people were in a mountain-shaking moment called war. The king of Assyria, who had already destroyed the northern kingdom in 722, was now threatening the southern kingdom of Judah. They had laid siege to Jerusalem. And the king of Assyria had real threat going on. In fact, was taunting, was trash-talking God's people. You can look it up for yourselves. In 2 Kings 18, this is what the king of Assyria said. Do not let Hezekiah, your king, deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord. When he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. This is a king pretty confident in his ability. And he probably had good reason. He had destroyed many nations. He was a king overall. He was a world power. But he didn't know about the Lord he was talking about. He didn't know about Yahweh. He didn't know that this is the God who calls out the mountains, who is over anything and over him. And because the psalmist had such confidence, the psalmist said these words, we won't fear in this mountain-shaking moment. We won't fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we won't be afraid. And not because of us, as we started this year, we didn't say we needed more of us, but because of God. Because God is the one who made the mountains, and God is over it all. And so our first takeaway, we may have mountain-shaking moments, but we have a God who made the mountains. And I'd love to tell you that if you're in God, you'll never be afraid. You'll never have moments of fear, or anxiety, or worry. I know that's not the case, but what you do have is the assurance of God who made the mountains. What we do have is God who's always there, and that's what we get to talk about today. How he helps us. How he speaks peace. And so in week three of our series, New Mercies, I hope you've been enjoying it. Uh, I love Pastor Jeff's sermon. Feel free to catch up on a new provision as he talked about anxiety last week. Uh, today we're going to talk about just confidence. That on the other end of this psalm, maybe we could have a little bit more trust and confidence as we enter the new year, as we enter mountain-shaking moments. Now, a bit, a bit about this psalm. Uh, some of you, uh, like me, uh, grew up Lutheran, and you might have sung along the way, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Have you heard this song? And, and this is the, the basis. This, this psalm is the basis for that great psalm. Uh, as God is referred to a couple times as a fortress, uh, an impregnable refuge. Uh, this psalm, uh, I set some of the context. Some say it was from the nation of Assyria as they were attacking. Uh, some say also it's a great picture of the end times. That there will come a day when the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. There will come a day when every eye will meet with God and we will just be still and know that he was always reigning as he's reigning now. So let's get into that psalm. Psalm chapter 46. Can we stand today? All right, let's stand in honor of the word of God. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. 
These are the powerful words of God. Before you sit down, could you say out loud or to your neighbor, a mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress is our God. Please grab a seat. In life, there are things that are present but not very helpful. Uh, present but not very helpful. I, I don't know if you have a newborn or a toddler. They are very present in your household, but when you're doing the dishes, they're not really helpful. I wanted to talk a little bit about pets. I, I love pets. Um, and I just want a quick poll. How many of you um, have cats? A few cat owners like myself. How many of you are smart and have dogs? Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. If I did life over again, we should probably get a dog over a cat. They are better pets, my friends. So let's bring up a, a dog that I would have chosen, a golden retriever in another life. Um, and let's just consider the beauty of a dog. When you need uh, someone to be there for you, a dog is there for you. When you need a uh, presence in your life, uh, there they are waiting when you get home. Uh, they get mad when you're away. Um, dogs can be therapeutic. Uh, when you are having a rough day, uh, psychologists would even say petting a dog can you know, relieve stress and be therapeutic. Um, it's good to have pets in our life. They are very present. But their help is limited, wouldn't you say? If you're having a health circumstance, if you're having what we had referred to a mountain-shaking moment, how much will your dog help you with your health? Not a ton. When you don't have answers for financial constraints, when you don't have answers for a relationship and its brokenness, how much will a dog guide you? Can't do much. So we live in a world where things are very present but not always supremely helpful. But then there's another category of life. There are people and things that are truly helpful, but not really available or present. For example, we're in basketball right now. I don't know if you've been to any basketball games recently. We've got basketball going on, tournaments. And I think it would be really helpful to have Steph Curry come in and coach our kids. I think they'd learn something, right? Uh, for 15 minutes, for an hour, to have the guy who is the master of the craft teach a jump shot, teach what made him so good. Like, they could learn something with Steph Curry. The only problem? He's not available. I can't call up and, hey, Steph, our kids need you. Nope, not going to happen, friends. So that's the world we live in. When we have problems, when we need coaching, there are things that are present but not supremely helpful, and there are things that are really helpful but not really present except for one category. As the psalmist is describing his mountain-shaking moment, he says about God, God is our refuge and our strength in ever-present help in trouble. He is not only present, but he is help. And I had fun translating the Hebrew this week, kind of geeked out over it. And I love when it makes really clumsy English, but really good sense. When I was translating ever-present, it, it was these two words, he is very found. Like, that's not good English. Like, God is very found. <laughs> but, but I love its understanding. Like, when I'm playing hide-and-seek, he's not hiding. I'm here. I'm very found. In fact, I love the other verse where it says he's there at break of day. And when it describes him being there at break of day, it's not saying God is like a morning person. And don't ask me at night because I'm not available at night. I'm a morning person, right? I'm a morning God. The reference is this idea that when no one else can get there fast enough, he's going to be right there. Our God is the one who is very present, ever present, even when no one else is. And that's a reason for supreme confidence. In fact, it's our fill-in. I believe confidence is found not in the absence of fear, but in the presence of God. God shows up and he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The disciples who got used to walking with Jesus and how great that would have been to walk with the Son of God. Before he ascended back into heaven, he assured his disciples and us, but surely... I'm with you always to the very end of the age when all the mountains are finally melted. I will still be there for you. And if this is the case, and if it's true we face mountain-shaking moments, then what should we do? Let's talk about that. I saw a mountain-shaking moment in the NFL a couple weeks ago, and maybe you saw it too. Monday Night Football 
and a guy almost died on the field. Damar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills, um, who suffered cardiac arrest, who was only revived through the help of medical experts who were there right on the field. And um, everyone just paused. And, and it was novel for many reasons. I, I mean, it, it definitely described how we're considering player safety a little bit more than we had in the past and, and how cognizant we are of that. But for me, looking at things from a spiritual lens, the thing that struck me most was the knee-jerk reaction of everyone there, the players, the crowd. What stuck out to me was this picture. And we don't know how many were Christian. We don't know how many claimed to be God believers or God lovers. But what they did instinctually is they turned to God. They prayed. In this mountain-shaking moments to the God who, who is over it all, to the God who made the mountains. I believe this event maybe happened, at least in my life, not to update me about DeMar Hamlin's health, which, you know, is, is good and he's recovering, so that, that's good. But, but let's be honest with the bigger story. The, the bigger story is the spiritual health of people in America and people who need God. And I hope it was to you what it was to me, a reminder that this is what we need to do often. Not just in the mountain-shaking moments, but in the small moments, in the medium moments, in all the moments God invites us because he is present and because he is helpful to turn to him and then gain confidence. And so let me ask you, what is the state of your prayer life? Are you uh, someone who knows how to regularly turn any and everything over to God? We have a God who has told us, cast all your anxiety on me because I care for you. You know, what it reminds me of is when problems come our way, what we're supposed to be doing, and what we're supposed to be doing is playing hot potato. You remember this game? The goal of hot potato was never to hold on to the potato. You hold on to the potato and then the music stops, you, you don't win. Go a hot potato, pass to someone else. And when mountain shaking moments come our way and worries come our way and anxieties come our way and heartbreak comes our way, that is simply a reminder to pass that on to someone who can handle it. Worry is simply a reminder that we need to pray, that we need to unload, we need to cast it off once again. And if we are in the habit of doing this, I believe confidence can come. It's found when we are a people who often cast off whatever is on us. Because whatever feels over us, God is over it. But therein lies our problem. Because we are a people who'd rather carry sometimes than cast off. We are a people who run to many other things rather than run to God. When we're dealing with health, we'll search the internet. We'll go to WebMD. When dealing with relationships, we'll have a two-hour conversation with a friend, dissecting it seven ways sideways to understand what my next step should be. We have people in our lives that we text and we snap, all in an effort to try to solve the problem that only maybe God can solve. The reality of our sinful nature is that instead of running after God, we run away from God. We don't want to hear from God. And so if we are to repent of anything this morning, it's to repent and to change our minds for all the times we've sought something else rather than him, sought some other answer rather than him, gone to something else first rather than him. Because consider the beauty of Jesus Christ. Every good thing in our world is just a glimmer of his goodness. Every answer that this world has ultimately have its basis in him. He is the foundation of all truth, of all health. Consider Jesus Christ, the one who, as we celebrate at Christmas, ran into this world for us. And he is the Jesus who says, I'm here for you. In the game of hide and seek, I'm not hiding. I'm here for you today just as I was there for you that day, the day that I died. I took your place. 
And on that day when I stood in your place, on that day when I hung from the cross and the sky turned black, on that day I cried out these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus reminds us, he reminds us that he felt the absence of God so that you would never have to. He endured the loneliness from the Almighty so that you would never be lonely. You could have always access to the God who has an answer for everything. And he has an answer for the ultimate anxiety, which is the consequence, the guilt and shame of sin, which is forgiveness through his cross. And the Almighty holds the answer still for every anxiety, for every worry, for every fear, for every concern. He's over whatever feels like is hanging over you. This is the beautiful reality of our God. And so with that, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things he does in his help, some of the things he does because he is present. And to talk a little further, um, I don't know um, if if you ever catch your your own self-talk. I wanted to ask you, what is the state of your self-talk? How, how do you talk to yourself about yourself? When it comes to your appearance, what is your self-talk? When it comes to your performance, what is your self-talk? When, when it comes to mountain-shaking moments, fears and anxieties, what is your self-talk? This is relevant for us at staff. Uh, we just did a, a, a book study on soundtracks, and it had the, the premise of, uh, you know, what are you saying inside your mind, right? Well, what is the, the track running over and over and over? Um, and, and the premise was this, that you got to change some of those soundtracks. Some of them are broken. And so in an effort to do so, uh, the, the author referred to Zig Ziglar. You guys know him? A motivational speaker, which I don't, are there still motivational speakers today? I think they give TED Talks. But anyway, so we went through Zig Ziglar's daily affirmations. In fact, it was an assignment for our staff that each day we would say it for the week, uh, some of his daily affirmations. I want to share with you some of the things Zig Ziglar said. So wake up and say to yourself, I have character and I'm knowledgeable. My convictions are strong and I have healthy self-image, a passion for what is right and a solid hope for the future. All right. What about this next one? Wake up and say, I have a high energy level. I'm enthusiastic and take pride in my appearance and what I do. All right, a final one. I am health conscious, balanced, and clean. Zig Ziglar. Now, again, you can find the whole list on the internet if you'd like. Uh, But but as I did this practice, um, and this is just me because I'm more of a negative person, but um, I, I had some cognitive dissonance from what I was saying. Um, My my self-talk was like, I don't believe what I'm saying. For instance, when it came to I have a high energy level, I'm like, I can't self-talk myself into being a morning person. I can't manifest being a morning person. I don't have a high energy level right now. It's 6 a.m. I am health conscious, balanced, and clean. That didn't work out during Christmas. Anyone else? (laughs) There was some cognitive dissonance going on over that statement. So regardless, I don't trust my self-talk. What I do trust is what God says. And replacing my broken soundtracks with the promises of God. And what are some of the things that God has stated about each one of us? Now this could be the rest of our day. I could tell you the beautiful promises of God. Let, Let me share one. From 1 Peter it says, But you... Your chosen people, out of all the people in the world, I who ordained your days, I had you in mind, I called you by name, I writ you on the palm of my hand, I count your hairs. You are chosen. You're not forgotten. You're not just a number. You're a royal priesthood. I think of the fascination of little girls who want to be princesses, and God says, yep, congratulations, you made it. A holy nation, you're, you're set apart. You were made to be different. God's special possession. God loves you more than a teenager loves their cell phone, more than a teenager loves Xbox. That's God. That you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light, and he gave us a purpose. How wonderful is this? Go on and on about all the things God says of you. In fact, some of you have been taught well. If you've been asked the question, who are you, what is the proper response? 
Phil said it beautifully in Romans 8. Our self-talk might say, well, I'm pastor, and I'm son, and I'm husband. But the God talk says, no, 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 I'm child of God. How great the love the Father has lavished on us, that we could be called child of God. That is what we are. And this is the power of God's word. In Psalm 46, when they needed confidence for a mountain-shaking moment, the psalmist said, Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, but he lifts his voice and the earth melts. That's his word, friends. You go back to the very beginning, and what is happening as God uses his word? He just calls out, and he doesn't just make one mountain, he makes all of them. He says the word, and scientists tell us that he made billions of galaxies, billions of stars, simply by saying they should be. And then Jesus came on the scene with his word. And he talked to a cripple and he said, get up, take your mat and go. And someone who was lame just started to walk. Told some lepers, go show yourselves to the priest. And on their way, they were healed. Said to a dead man, Lazarus, come out. And life came back. And the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever is still using his word to be the only medicine that we need to answer our fear and anxiety, to soothe our soul. And so how do we have confidence? Confidence comes as we wrap ourselves up in his word, as, as we dwell deeply on his promises, as we let this psalm take root in our souls, as we, as we don't let it go, as we meditate on it day and night. And so I need to ask you, what is the state of your personal devotional life? Are you hearing from God regularly? Are you hearing from God quantitatively? If you would do a study of time, who has the biggest voice in your life? Is it your coworkers? Is it is your spouse? Is it Fox News? Is it CNBC? What is it? God should be the one speaking to you more than we even speak to ourselves through the promises of his word because we are not reliable and no one else is either. Wrap yourself up in his word. But perhaps my favorite thing is the context of this section. So I referred to the king of Assyria who came and laid siege to Jerusalem, the southern kingdom of Judah. And there was a good king reigning at the time, King Hezekiah, and there weren't many good kings at that time. But King Hezekiah knew in this mountain-shaking moment what he needed to do, so he went to God, he went to the temple, and he started to pray. And Hezekiah's prayer is recorded in 2 Kings 19. says, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over the kingdoms of the earth. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. And as Hezekiah prayed and he relied on the ever-present help, the God who is a refuge, God answered. And the God of angel armies, the Lord of hosts, he didn't need an army of angels. He sent one angel that night that won the war. Recorded in 2 Kings 19, the greatest victory, one angel who devastates 185,000 Assyrians. Now, if that strikes you, let me just tell you, the author of life at any time has the right to take any life back. He is in control. But the author of life did that that day. And he won the war through one angel. The God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever is the God who's fighting for us. Just as he fought for Moses and the people of God when they were entrapped by Pharaoh and the Red Sea and they needed only be still as God made a way through the sea and won that war. This is the God who when the, the people of, of, of Jerusalem, the, the people, the Pharisees at the time of Jesus, they wanted to throw Jesus off a cliff and it wasn't his time, friends. And so Jesus just walks right by that crowd this is the God who, when he had to deal with death, climbed out of the tomb because nothing over us stands over God. He is above it all. You have a God who fights for you. What if in the next moment of fear and anxiety, you imagine that angel who won the war for Assyria? You imagine that one who's right here. Do you think he could handle whatever's going on? 
Do you think he could protect your kids? Do you think he could get you through? What if we remembered he's the God who still makes all things work for the good of those who love him, called according to the purpose? Well, then we could have confidence, right? And confidence comes as you remember God is fighting for us. And so if we would take this psalm and we would sink it deep into our souls, what would our lives look like? And, and there's a part of me that wishes that we would never be afraid again. That, that, that we would say with the psalmist, even when the mountains shake, we will not fear. But I'm not sure that's the expectation. I've um, been walking with God for a long time. I wish I could tell you I never fear. I never deal with anxiety or worry. Not the case. So I have a little bit different expectation. I believe that instead of that expectation, there, there's a different one. Verse 5. And verse 5 says, God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. See, what I find is, is, is maybe that, it's, that we'll never fear more that we will never fall. That's an expectation I can make sense of. I wish, again, my faith was complete. Someday it will be, where I'm never afraid of nothing. <laughs> I don't know if that's my expectation, but I do believe if I stay with God as he stays with me, I'm not going to fall. You know, that's what I observed recently in a friend of mine. I, I reported earlier this year of a classmate who was called to heaven through a car accident, Pastor Aaron Strong. Well, the faith confession of his wife is just incredible. Uh, she was on Facebook just the other day. It was about three months after uh, him being called to heaven. I was just reporting kind of the state of things. I want to share with you her confession of faith. She said, it's been three months since my children lost their fun parent. It's been three months since I lost my best friend and husband. But it's been three months since God wrapped me in his arms in a way I could never have imagined. It's been three months since God has given me a laser focus on him and has strengthened my faith like it's never been before. This is a confession of a lady who, because God was within her, she did not fall. That's what can happen with us. I can't wish away or manifest away mountain-shaking moments, but I can tell you because God is within you, you're not going to fall. And this celebration is just a foretaste of an eternal one where our faith is complete where there is never any shred of fear or anxiety or worry because we are caught in the arms of unfailing love. May God give you that confidence. Amen. And the peace of God, which transcends our understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this point, we have the opportunity to share our faith uh, that we're not alone. And today we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed as we confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.